Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. I am your host, Renee Bauer, and I am really excited to introduce you to my friend. Um, we've connected recently, but she's just someone that I immediately connected with and felt like we were talking the same talk. And um, so I'm really excited to bring her on to this podcast and um, for her to share her story. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Twyla Marks. Twyla is a mom of two adult children and the author of the book called The Unexpected, The Ride of My Life, which is a nonfiction book about her journey of the highs and lows of marriage and divorce and recovery. She is very passionate about helping others recover from divorce and also to encourage others to start a new journey because this is not the end. But she is also a podcast host of Talks with Twyla. That's how I met you, and your podcast is awesome. Uh, and in that space, she encourages, inspires, informs, and empowers. It is available on all major podcast platforms, and it currently has listeners from all over the world. So it is just so good, and she has like the best voice in the world. And then I just learned that she actually was born in Hartford, Connecticut, so I didn't know that before. So welcome, Twyla. Thank you, Renee. I'm happy to be here. Excited to be on your podcast. So thank you so much for having me. No problem. So I was reading your book and I saw that you were born in Hartford and like we did not, I don't think we talked about that. How long did you live in Connecticut before you moved? Wow, that's funny. I don't recall anything about Harper Connecticut. Ah, that's why it didn't come up in conversation. <laughs> and, uh, I was born there, and then my family, they moved to Texas in a small town called Wichita Falls, Texas. So that's where I was actually raised. Yeah. And where are you now? I am in Dallas, Texas. All right. Go Cowboys. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, because every week I see you with your, like, your full gear on, cheering them on. Yes, yes. I'm a diehard fan, diehard fan. So. <laughs> so let's talk about your recovery, um, your divorce recovery and your journey to get there because it wasn't a smooth process for you. And I know you write about that in your book. So did you have a moment in your marriage that was sort of like a light bulb moment for you where you said, you know what, this is no longer serving me and I have to do something? Oh, yes. A light bulb. You said it. Renee, absolutely. I was married to this man 10 years, and just to give a, the, your viewers um, and listeners kind of a summary of what I went through, I married a guy, I was young, and um, he just kind of came in and swept me off my feet, right? And I decided that it wasn't the best relationship uh, for me. And so you asked about a light bulb moment. About five years in, Renee, I really, really wanted to end my marriage. And I thought, wow, I have children. They were all minors. We had a son together. He had a son prior to our relationship and I had a daughter. So we blended our family together, but I just wasn't happy. And I kind of just thought, well, let me try to make this work. So we attended counseling and uh, but the light bulb moment for me was um, year nine. I actually took a road trip and went um, actually to my grandmother's house, to Wichita Falls. And it's so peaceful there. It's a small town. And I really had to get in a peaceful space to decide my next move because I just was not happy. It, physically, it was affecting me, uh, of course, emotionally, mentally, and of course, spiritually. So the light bulb moment, I took that road, I had my kids and I, and I just told him, hey, well, we're going away for the weekend. I went and read several books, just me, myself, and I. That's my soulless, peaceful space. And when I went back, Renee, I knew I had to leave. I, I, it, it just was, wow, the light bulb just, you know, mm -hmm. shadowed me all over my body. And I just said, you know, I, I have to leave this man. And unfortunately, that's what I did. And I worried about my kids, but I also worried about staying in a toxic marriage and what that was going to do to my kids. Right. 
How did he take the news? Was it an easy divorce or was it something that like most people see there's bumps and ups and downs and you know, it's not a straight path. Yes, it, it was not And no, he did not take the news very well. Initially he thought I was kidding <laughs> to be honest with you. And I wasn't, I was so serious and he, uh, thought, well, let's work on it. And I said, well, I'm just not happy and I do want a divorce. And we've tried and the kids aren't happy. There was constant arguments and just, it just wasn't right. He and I just weren't made for each other. You know, um, some people are better friends than they are spouses, right? And you, you took the words out of my mouth because I think like, this is what I want to talk about a little bit, because I feel like a lot of people feel like they need a definitive reason to leave. So they need that, you know, you know, if, if the answer would be easy, if it was domestic violence or if there was substance abuse, or if there was something that they could say, okay, this is the reason why. But sometimes there isn't really a reason why, except for that relationship is no longer a good fit. And that's okay. And I feel like that's where people really get stuck. It's, it's that group. It's you. It's me. It's like where it's like, hey, it's not good enough. But is that a good enough reason to leave? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's so true, Renee, because I, I had reasons, but you know, and you're right. Some people feel they need a reason. It, our relationship and marriage just, it, I mean, it started off rocky and I don't want to tell my entire book because I wrote about this entire journey, but it started off rocky and I'll share this. I was three months pregnant at the altar standing there about to say I do to this man, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and it just started out real rocky. The families kind of didn't care for each other. There was a lot of animosity. I mean, there was a, there was a lot going on. And so uh, I always say the foundation of my marriage just was not solid. And mm -hmm. it just was a tailspin. And I don't say, I always tell people every day was not a nightmare on Elm Street, but it was, uh, it was just toxic and dysfunctional. So what was the first thing that you did after you had your light bulb moment and you said, okay, this is what I want. Where did you go from there? And I asked this question because I think that there's a lot of people who have those light bulb moments and then they don't do anything about it. And they're sitting there two, three years later, still having those moments. Absolutely. Yeah. I actually, once um, he really thought I was serious and he saw that I was serious. I started seeking legal counsel. I spoke with several different divorce attorneys and I needed one, Renee, whom I connected with, you know, wholeheartedly. Um, so I went through two or three um, consultations before I found that one. So I literally hit the ground running. I didn't wait weeks, days, months, or years. It was in my mind, this is what I'm doing and let's get this ball rolling. I mean, that's momentum because if you just sit and you ponder and you question, it's like your heart is telling you what you need to do. But then if you allow so much time, your head will talk you out of anything, you know? Absolutely. And and the more you talk to people who have opinions about it, like that will, you'll start to doubt yourself. And I think you bring up a really good point about, going on several consultations with several different lawyers and that, you know, that's something that I always tell people, I have people sitting in my office and I'll be like, go meet with a couple lawyers. And it's not that like I'm sending you away, but not every lawyer is a good fit for every person or every situation. And like, it's so important to connect with that person um, and just feel like that gut instinct. Okay. This is someone that I can really work with and I can trust with kind of like the worst time in my life right now. Yes, yes, you know, and I, that's so true because, you know, everybody's not a good fit, just like every relationship's not a good fit. Right. Yeah, so that's what I did, and um, we just got the show while rolling, and um, it took about a year, but Renee, within that year of time frame, when I tell you, well, you, you've read my book, or <laughs> it was a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because you, then feelings are involved, right? Um, he wasn't happy, obviously. So 
he tried to make my life miserable and he did a good job of it for several months. I, I literally thought I was going to lose my mind based on the things that he was doing to meet myself and my kids. And so how did you get out of that hamster wheel of conflict and just negativity? Yeah. Yeah. So I, he got tired of fighting me. Uh, this was after the divorce was final and uh, he actually came to me and uh, months later and he asked me for his forgiveness and he said, you know, I really am tired of fighting you. I, I want to have a good relationship with my son or our son, Kyle. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm tired. Would you just forgive me? And I was like, well, I, I, <laughs> and I, I thought this is not happening. This is not reality here. You know, did this man just have an overnight awakening? What happened? You know, but that was my story. And I know that's not everybody's story because forgiveness is tough. Um, and I'm very passionate and very intentional about teaching and talking about forgiveness because that's something that has to happen. You know, it's not easy. It's not an office, but it makes your life so much better once you get to that point in life, especially when, if you have children. Absolutely. And when he said, I'm sorry, did, did the tone shift in your relationship and in the way your divorce progressed? It did. Yes. Yes. I, I felt like I could be in the same vicinity, in the same space as him. And yeah, it did. I mean, we weren't BFFs and we're not still to this day. We don't go to Starbucks and have a cup of coffee together, <laughs> but we can coexist. We can have a conversation. And, you know, this, again, it's been 12 years that we did get to that point. And yes, yeah, so your question, the answer to your question, the tone definitely did shift completely. It, that's, it's so interesting to me. And I think that it's so impactful of someone saying, or maybe both people saying, I'm sorry during the divorce process. It doesn't mean that you're going to get back together, but just that I'm sorry for whatever I did or my contribution or, you know, and I think that it, that goes a really long way in helping the two people to come together and say, okay, like now let's start over and let's figure out how we can get through this so we can both move on rather than sort of get caught up in this anger that happens. And that's when uh, divorces get expensive. That's when people are in trial and they're so angry and they're blaming and they're the victim. And yeah. you just wonder if like everyone did that at some point and sat down and said, I'm sorry, like how that would change the outcome. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we, we went through it I mean, several uh, uh, cases or court dates that we went through and because, you know, he was angry. He wanted to do everything to me to make my life miserable. Um, just so petty. If I was late a few minutes uh, with Kyle, uh, he would call the police, like, mm -hmm. I'm interfering with his visitation, and we'd be back in court. Oh, it was a lot. I was like, oh my gosh, if I could get that money back. <laughs> I know. <laughs> For all of that, you know, we went through, this is post-divorce, because he was so angry. He was so angry. And I think people don't realize that the lawyers can't come in and fix that. So if someone's late for a visitation, there's nothing that a lawyer can do, a court's going to do. Like these are just so minor, but it just continues to add fuel to the animosity and the conflict between the two people, which trickles down to the kids. Yeah, absolutely. It does. Absolutely. So, you know, and speaking of kids, Renee, I was very, very intentional uh, to not bash or speak negatively about his dad in front of him. I mean, there were a couple of times where I did slip because I just couldn't take any more. But for the most part, I did my best not to bash um, his dad because I didn't want that to come back on me. And my son felt as if I kept him away from his dad and then he would have animosity, he being my son, have animosity towards me. So that's why I did that. And I always encourage people to do the same. I know it's not easy. It's tough. You know, when this man is driving you insane, you know, it's like yeah. you want to get back at him and, you know, retaliate. But 
that's just not the best thing to do because in the long run, it will come back to bite you. Yeah, and it hurts your kids. They don't want to hear it. They love both parents. They do not want to be put in the middle. So you, it doesn't serve any purpose. So good for you for doing that. So Twyla, let's switch it up and talk about your divorce recovery story. Like you got divorced. What happened outside the other end? Like you're in a really good place right now. You are like on the top of the world. You have an awesome podcast. You have a book. You're helping other people who have gone through this process. Like, how did you get to the point where you are that, you know, I imagine when you were in the thick of it, you never thought that you would be sitting here today, you know, having these conversations. So what, what shifted in you? Wow, that is so true. I, I never would have thought. And I actually posted something about that earlier. Yes, I, so after the divorce, I gave myself time to heal and get back out there in the dating scene. And I actually met a guy who I actually thought was the one, Renee. I literally thought I was going to marry that man. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that relationship, unfortunately, ended about a year and a half into the relationship. And then I just thought, you know, I, it took me a few months to get over him because I was so in love, like in love. And I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to be single. And if it mm -hmm. happens, it happens. And I am, I am in a happy place. I don't seek to go out on dates. I'm not on dating sites. I'm just doing my podcast and living my best life. <laughs> <laughs> Watching the Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> would you ever get remarried? I, I, I would, I would consider the, with the right man, you know, th this time. And I, you know, I, I would, I would, I, I'm not totally against it at all, but he would definitely have to be a knight in shining armor, armor, uh, <laughs> just sweep me off my feet. And we'd have to date for a while and yeah. get to know a lot of people think, just get out there and rush. You meet someone six months later, you're engaged. Another three months, you're married. No, take your time. Mm -hmm. Get to really, really know that person, right? Yeah. And I think that's so important because you have to, you have to know yourself. And so post-divorce, I think it's really um, the, it, almost a knee-jerk reaction to jump into something else because it's, it's like a band-aid. It takes away the pain. It's exciting. Like dating somebody, you know, those first dates, the first kisses, the first everything is fun. And so you, you kind of forget and you sort of mask that pain and you haven't really figured out what it is that you actually need and want in a relationship because you haven't given yourself that space. And I think that's why the statistics are probably as staggering as they are with the the second and third marriages that fail and it's because those people hadn't really learned from that first uh, marriage and they keep making the same mistake and thinking if they pick the opposite of their last spouse then that will fix everything and that couldn't be further from the truth yes absolutely absolutely so i'm just gonna take my time and I've only been in that one serious relationship since my divorce and it's been 12 years. So I'm moving at a snail's pace. <laughs> That's okay. But you know what? Who says that you have to move at any certain pace? Like it's what works for you. There isn't a, there, there isn't like, oh, in two years, you're supposed to have done this or like you, this is your life. And if that's where you are right now, then that's where you are. And that's totally fine. Yeah. Absolutely. It is. It, wor it works for me. <laughs> so you talk about in your book that you thought that you always wanted the fairy tale and, you know, and, and I think, I mean, don't we grow up sort of with that? And as, I mean, this is probably a much bigger issue of like looking at what the movies show and like the fairy tale, the princess and all of that. And then that gets flipped on its head. So what is, what do you consider your fairy tale life now as you sit here with all of that experience behind you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, my fairy tale life is just, I always say and talk about peace, drama free living, right? And the, in order for me to go on and remarry, I would say, Renee, the person would really have to bring that space to my life, drama free, peaceful. 
I don't choose to be with someone that has small children because mine are grown and gone. <laughs> and that's okay to say that. Like, that's the thing. Like, there's no shame in saying that. None, none. I mean, there are some expectations that I have um, based on, like, as you just stated, based on what I've gone through, I can have those high expectations because I'm not going back to that type of lifestyle again, you know? So what made you decide to write this book and what did the writing journey look like? And I asked this question, not for my divorce lawyer hat, but for my writer's hat, because I'm a writer too. And it's such a, a different process for everyone. So I'm super curious as to how it went for you. Yeah. Yeah. So I initially, my book started out being something completely different. Um, actually, I started writing Renee while I was married. And I thought that I was going to write about blended families because that was our life. And it was very unique uh, for us uh, because the son, his son that I raised didn't even know his mom. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was literally figure he knew and that happened at four years old for him. But yeah, it started out being completely different. And then life happened and here I got divorced and I thought my life's journey. And so um, that's what, what happened. And I talked a little bit about my childhood because there are some things that happened to me as a child, I feel that um, allowed me to think how I th thought as an adult, um, as far as the child, me thinking I was abandoned and not knowing my father and a lot of things and being raised by my grandmother. So yeah, I just thought, I've got to write about this. Didn't want to write a memoir, a fictional memoir. I wanted the reader to know I'm speaking, and this is my truth, and this is what happened to me. You know, it didn't make up fictional character names. Yeah, that was it. And so, yeah, yeah. It's so brave because that... You know, as a writer, I think one of the hardest things to do is put your words out into the world or have someone else's eyes on them. And so, so often, like as I write something, it's like no one's looking at this until, like I feel like it's polished and perfect and all of that, but you're you're just kind of bleeding out onto the page is really what your book is. It's, you know, it's sort of a tell-all and it's raw and it's emotional. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, straight from the horse's mouth, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> so where, where, um, where can we find it? So yeah, yeah, you can go to my website. That is Twyla M. Mark. So that's T-W-Y-L-A-M-M-A-R-K-S dot com. And there you can find my book. I'll sign it and ship it directly to you. Awesome. And I'll put that in the show notes too. But before I let you go, what advice do you have um, for someone who's sitting in where you were that 12 years ago and they're sort of stuck and they, maybe the light bulb went off, but they haven't had any uh, movement? Like, what advice do you give someone about um, taking that next step? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I would say that if that is what you truly want to do, um, go ahead and make that next move and make that next step. Because I always tell people, Renee, make sure that's the decision you want to make. Or, you know, because if it's, if it's based on emotions, go back to the drawing board, but really and really get in tune with, is this the right decision to make? Especially if there's children involved, because going through a divorce, there is a lot to deal with, especially when you have kids. You're trying to balance your emotions, your children, make sure they're okay. So I, I would say, don't make that decision based strictly on emotions, or maybe you just had an argument with your spouse. Oh, I want a divorce. Oh, make sure that's what you really wanna do. Yeah. And I think it's so important to ha get professional help too, and go to therapy and to have that support system. And so that you're really talking through what your emotions are and whether something can be fixed or not, because some things can be, you yeah. know, so it's, you know, in this space and you do too, we were talking about divorce and it's not like, Hey, everyone needs a divorce. No, like it's, Go through all of these motions, go to the marriage counseling, go to your individual therapy, 
do all of these things to figure out, like, is this the right move for me before taking that next step? Yeah. And that's so true, Renee. Uh, He and I, we went to counseling several times, you know, during the marriage and we tried to make it work and just inevitable. It just didn't work. And even after I got divorced, I went through counseling myself. I worked on me. It was part of that self-healing process, right? I had to go to counseling and just talk things through with the therapist. And it, it is a process. And I think that's the most important part of this it's a process. Like nothing is going to happen quickly. It's, it will take you months, maybe years to really heal and become whole again. And that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. It so Twyla, three years, three years. See, like that's totally fine. And I, that's kind of what I hear. Like I, I have the stories I've heard is, you know, it took a couple people a year just to kind of get themselves off the bathroom floor you know, and then maybe they didn't start dating until a year after that, but there isn't any, there isn't any one way of doing it. And so it's, you take the time that you need and no one knows better than yourself. That's right. So thank you, Twyla. Um, I am so appreciative of you being here. I love your book. I adore your podcast, um, but you know that already. So I'm going to put all of the show notes. Thank you so much for sharing. And I encourage everyone, Um, who's in that process and in that place right now to pick up her book called The Unexpected, The Ride of My Life, um, because it's just so beautiful. So much. Thank you, Renee, for having me out there. I really enjoyed it today.